Welcome everyone. I am Mark Luger. I'm the Director of Facilities and Lake Operations here. This is exciting to see uh, this kind of turnout to talk about the lake and the lake health. And, uh, you know, this is all very dear to our hearts. Uh, many of you have, have expressed in either one or more emails to me, uh, both good and bad comments about uh, our lake health. So we've taken the opportunity as the association to bring in our partners in the lake health. Uh, my team, Facilities Overseas Lake Operations, uh, our partners at Solitude, Solitude uh, work very closely with us and with the management team as it comes to uh, the lake health, the water quality, the fisheries, the, uh, the plantings and so forth, so that we can take care of this pristine facility and really the, the gem of, of our community. So this will be a, a briefing by a Solitude. Uh, Shannon and Tyler, I've been working with them for the two and a half years I've been here. Uh, they have been here much longer and worked with, with Tom prior to that. And so I'm gonna turn the uh, floor over to them and they'll present a briefing, uh, questions and answer sessions throughout the briefing or whatever format they would like to have. So this is uh, to inform you about the type of things we're doing here, the health of our lake and our fisheries. So please feel free to, to offer up your questions as, as we go and uh, I'll let them address it. So I turn that over to you. All right, thanks Mark. Welcome everyone. I am Shannon Jr. I am an aquatic ecologist and business development consultant for Solitude. Tyler Meehan is uh, one of our fisheries biologists. Um, so essentially we're here today to give you a basic overview of the health of the lake. Throughout the presentation, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt. This is for you. The actual presentation part is probably fairly short, so we definitely want to make this valuable for, for everyone. So we're gonna basically uh, go over the water quality testing that we've done. We're gonna talk about the aquatic plantings we've done, uh, do an overview of the, the fisheries, and then um, questions after and during. To kind of summarize what we're doing with water quality testing, we test for E. coli May through October at the five beaches, the spillway, uh, a site in the lower lake in Adams Cove, and we also test at Tufton Pond. And then we do comprehensive water quality testing four times a year at two locations in the lake. And during that testing, we take a dissolved oxygen and temperature profile. We take water quality samples from the surface water and down near the bottom. And we take a sample and send it for algae identification and enumeration. These are our sample sites. The flags in yellow are the E. coli um, sites. Tufton Pond isn't on here, but that's another one. And then the purple locations are where we take the water quality samples. Yes? Yeah, I have a question. Sure. How come you guys do not do testing on the bottom of the coves, like on Jackson Cove, we have the big stream that comes from the food line or in all those homes on uh, uh, Acres Lane. How can we not do testing on the uh, other one by beach, uh, the mouth, uh, what's it, Monroe Cove, or goes all the way down there, where the stream comes in from um, the golf course and things like that? Because it seems like those are areas of contention. Yeah, well, I mean, essentially, we're trying to get representative samples of the overall water quality. We're not really doing a research project, so to speak. We're not, we don't have a hypothesis. We are monitoring water quality. So the, you know, when you're doing water quality sampling, when you're just setting up a basic program, you want to sample in the deepest part of the lake, which is why we're sampling there near the spillway, and then another representative sample from further upstream in the lake. And it's also budget driven. I mean, we could collect a hundred water samples throughout the lake, but it's just, we have to kind of make a decision about what makes the most sense. So this is what we've been doing. It's repeatable and it's providing good baseline information. But you uh, on that previous many... slide said that you're testing for E. coli on the previous well, slide. And if we're having a problem, I would think where all of these drainage things are coming into the lake, 
that would be the ideal place to pick it up rather than on the main beaches, even though the people swimming on the main beaches, but when it's getting into the lake at the source, I would think that's important. Okay, I'm sorry, I thought you were talking about general water quality testing. Yeah, sure. Over the past six or eight years, this program has evolved. Right. So the short answer to your question is, they're under contract to do this. Um, this is the testing that they do. Overall, we're monitoring the lake, and they're here to give an overview on what they're under contract to do and what our findings are. What you're poking at is there are lift stations throughout the lake and manhole covers that are near the water's edge. The infrastructure's old. Um, the maintenance department works closely with Aqua, as we do. Um, so there is an issue with those stations overflowing, flowing into the lake. And what we're challenging Aqua to do is identify improvements. There's no remote monitoring. There's no containment systems right now. And it's an aging infrastructure. So when there's a leak that goes into the lake, the maintenance department takes the samples in those locations you're talking about. And then we aggressively test it till we can reasonably assure that it's safe to go back in those other areas. Is your testing and their testing uh, the same as far as um, the results, not the results, the, the quality of the testing? In other words, when they test and you guys test, are you testing for different things? Yes. We're primarily testing for E. coli. They're testing for E. coli. They're also doing dissolved oxygen, temperature, and other other areas. Are you testing for uh, nitrates and phosphates and other pollutants that come into the lake? Yeah, I'm going to go over our sampling protocol and everything that we're testing for. And that's why I'm concerned about all these drainage areas, because if the other things are coming into our lake water and are affecting the lake water, we know what happened to Lake Anna recently. I would think that those would be the great areas to pick up these uh, chemicals that are coming into the lake. So, as Tom said, we have a contract that outlines what we're supposed to do. So that's what, that's what we do. I mean, we've, there's certainly a lot of other testing that can be done. Um, and we can talk about some of that as well. But for right now, I'm going to go over the results of what, what we've done so far. So for each one of the parameters we're monitoring, I'm going to go over a very kind of basic explanation of why we test for that and what the implications are for the lake health. This is, for if anyone in the room is a scientist, this is very basic. Um, and then for people that have no science background, it might be really boring. So I tried to kind of toe the line between both. But essentially, dissolved oxygen is a measurement of how much oxygen is dissolved in the water column. And that's, um, you know, oxygen gets in the water either by direct diffusion at the water surface, really mostly by wind action, and then it's also produced by plants and algae during photosynthesis. When you have a lot of organic matter in a lake, like decaying plants, leaf litter, fish waste, as that stuff de um, decomposes, it sucks oxygen out of the water. So that's one way that oxygen can be lost in a water body. And then also, cold water naturally holds a lot more oxygen than warm water. So colder water has more dissolved oxygen than warm water. So in the summer months, you will find that water quality can become kind of stressed because of low d dissolved oxygen. Um, that's most important maybe because fish require dissolved oxygen. They breathe um, through the water and they become stressed when the oxygen level is below five milligrams per liter. And if it gets less than two milligrams per liter, that is extremely harmful and they really can't survive for long periods of time in those conditions. This is the result so far this year for dissolved oxygen. Just to kind of explain what we're seeing on the graph, this is the x-axis is the dissolved oxygen level and the y-axis is the water depth. So we're basically looking at a profile through the water column of dissolved oxygen from the surface to the bottom. So you can see at the surface you have highly oxygenated water and as you go down in the water column there's a lot less oxygen. This right here, that red line, is the five milligram per liter 
mark. So what this shows us is that, um, you know, for instance, in July, below about 12 and a half feet in the water column and even more shallow higher up in the lake, there's less dissolved oxygen than what is ideal for the fish. Um, so this is just to kind of show a comparison between years. Every year it varies. It's going to um, vary based on weather, the um, water temperature, the rain events. Um, so you will get a, a difference um, between each year and then also seasonally. So you can see like in May, you had much higher dissolved oxygen and it went much deeper in the water column. And as you get through the season, it gets you know less and less as you go up in the water column. And you can see in September, you know, July is typically the worst. Once we get into September, it starts to get a little bit better. That, that was the lower lake sample. This is mid lake and you're seeing the same phenomenon. It's a little bit more mixed in the middle lake. Um, it's about 30 feet deep in that sampling area, about 60 feet deep in the um, deep water area. So shallow water tends to be a little bit more mixed than the deeper water. Just looking at the trends here between uh, 22 and 23, it looks like it's gotten worse. Well, it's hard to really make that leap with, it varies from year to year because of, um, it could change next year based on weather patterns. But trend lines over maybe 10 or 20 years, you may start to notice a decline, but you will also see a lot of fluctuation year to year. What effect does uh, boating traffic have on dissolved oxygen? There can be a little bit of mixing and maybe some temporary entrainment of oxygen, but then currents and wave action can actually cause negative effects because of erosion. So that's kind of a loaded question. Um, you know, I wouldn't say there's one easy answer to that question. I'm just wondering whether the stirring up of the lake does help this situation. Um, to, well, yes and no, because the stirring up can mix and get a little bit of oxygen in the water, but then it can also suspend sediment from the bottom and from the edge, which is a uh, bad thing. So. We see that there's been an aerator used up at the golf course. Effectively, I guess, that it has eliminated some of the algae and allowed for better water quality there. Is there any consideration of an aerator or two on the main lake? So that's been discussed, but it's, the price tag is exorbitant. I mean, it would be more probably more than $100,000 to adequately aerate the lake. You might have, maybe there would be some spots where some little surface aerators might be helpful in some stagnant coves, but as far as aerating the entire lake and mixing it, that's a very expensive proposition. Now on to temperature. So water temperature and dissolved oxygen are very closely related to each other. Um, Temperature has a lot of effects on the, on the lake as far as dissolved oxygen, which we already talked about, the rate of photosynthesis of plants, and also aquatic organisms, their rate of metabolism, and then also their sensitivity to diseases and parasites. If, if it gets too hot or too cold, then they can uh, be more sensitive to problems. Cold water naturally contains more dissolved oxygen, so lakes can become naturally stressed during warmer months. Um, so deeper lakes like Lake Monticello, they do become stratified during the summer, which means that warm water at the surface, warm water is lighter than cold water. So as that warm water heats up, it becomes much lighter and then there's a density gradient between the warm water and the cold water and that prevents mixing in the lake. And eventually those, um, you know, that thermocline can really prevent that bottom water from interacting with atmospheric oxygen. So what, what can be bad is when that thermocline is very close to the surface, then you end up with a very large portion of the water column that can go hypoxic, which means low oxygen, or anoxic, which means no oxygen. And again, that's a very natural phenomenon that occurs in every lake. Certain areas of the uh, certain areas of the world, there's it mixes more times and fewer times. In our area, it's basically in the summer it stratifies and then it, it's mixed at the rest of the year. It's typically about 15 feet at Lake Monticello in the summer could be 12 feet if the water gets up to 90 degrees. Where yeah, really and 
you're right, <laughs> as the graph tells us, yep. And again, this is gonna vary during different times of the year. This is this year's data from uh, the lower lake and the middle lake. So, um, you know, you can kind of see between 15 and 20 feet is where you really start to see that um, stratification setting up. And, you know, it, I guess the important thing to note is in July, you're looking at like surface temperatures around 80 and bot bottom temperatures around 30. So that's a huge um, temperature gradient be between the surface and the bottom. And again, just kind of putting last year's data up here for comparison. So you can see in April, it's pretty well mixed. But then when you get into the hot summer months, July, September, you have a lot more of that stratification. And then the same thing in the mid lake, although again, it is more mixed because it's shallower in the middle of the lake. Now we get into the a little more technical part of it. Um, so phosphorus is the primary limiting nutrient in freshwater lakes. So essentially the amount of phosphorus is the main driver of um, the productivity of a lake. Um, it's in many different forms in the water, but um, you know, it can be organic, it can be inorganic, it can be dissolved, it can be particulate. But the biologically available form that um, algae and plants can use is soluble inorganic orthophosphate. So that's the most um, available form. The way that phosphorus gets into the water is mostly through runoff, soil particles, erosion, fertilizer. If you fertilize your lawn and it rains afterwards, phosphorus is going into the lake. And then organic matter. So um, leaf debris and grass clippings and any kind of organic matter adds phosphorus to the lake. And then the reason why we take bottom water quality samples is during times of low oxygen, there's also phosphorus that's bound up in the sediment. And when you don't have oxygen, there are chemical reactions that allow some of that orthophosphate to release into the water column. So we're trying to gauge the, the level to, what, to which that's happening in the lake. Um, so we care about phosphorus because if you have a ton of phosphorus. If you have a phosphorus enriched lake, it really can lead to water quality problems and ultimately to cyanobacteria blooms like what have been happening in Lake Anna and Smith Mountain Lake. Um, where it gets tricky is the desired level of phosphorus is different depending on what the use of a lake is. So for clean water, for swimming and recreation, typically we would like to see phosphorus levels below 25 micrograms per liter. For a productive fishery, you want it higher than that because you want to have it more productive and you want more algal growth. When you have lakes like Lake Monticello where some people care a lot about fishing and other people care about swimming and looking at a pretty lake, you have some disagreement in how the lake should be managed. We can't broker those discussions. All we can do is provide information and guidance. Um, for Lake Monticello, because it is a multi-use lake, typically we want to see the less than 25 milligrams per liter is what we would consider to be desirable. Um, so that's kind of how most freshwater multi-use lakes are managed to try to reduce the amount of phosphorus and um, keep, it, keep the water quality a little more pristine. So here's our phosphorus readings. So this is awesome. If there are lakes in Virginia that would kill to have this water quality, um, every you know you're barely above that 25 microgram limit here, and that's at the surface and the bottom. So th that's very good news. This is last year's results for comparison. You had one little spike up to 84. To put it in perspective. Smith Mountain Lake in certain areas has hundreds of milligrams of uh, micrograms, sorry, of phosphorus. So, um, so yeah, th there's a, you know, a difficulty in kind of brokering the goals of a lake, but from my perspective, from a water quality perspective, this is very good news. And again, this is just the middle lake. You had, um, you know, a couple hits a little bit of phosphorus coming out of the sediment during the warmer weather, a little hit at the surface there, but again, nothing concerning. It could have been associated with even a storm event could cause that. So nitrogen, 
Um, it's also important, but in freshwater, it is not the limiting nutrient. So we don't, I don't want to say we don't care about it, but it's not as critical to water quality in freshwater as it is in saltwater. Um, it's also in a lot of different forms, but the inorganic forms, again, are the ones that are the most biologically available. And, you know, there's also the organic forms, and I won't get deep into the nitrogen cycle, but those can actually be converted to available forms by animals and by oxidation. Kind of some of the same ways it gets into the pond, fertilizer, animal waste, septic systems can cause nitrogen spikes. And the reason we look at it, and again, I'm not, this is like, you, this is a huge topic in our industry right now, the nitrogen phosphorus ratio is really important for managing lakes, but that's mostly when you have high phosphorus that you have to worry about it. In general though, it's preferable to have an N to P ratio greater than 16.1 for good water quality. We don't need to really worry about that at Lake Monticello because you don't, we are not worrying about a nitrogen limited lake, so it's not critical. And you'll see, that's our nitrogen results. Everything below the threshold of the test. And then I don't even think I did a comparison with last year because it was, everything was below 0.1 and you wanna see it below one. So nitrogen isn't really a, a factor here. So E. coli, we've already talked about that a little bit. Uh, type of bacteria that is found in the GI tracts of humans and animals. And when you find that bacteria in the water, it's generally a sign that there has been fecal contamination by warm-blooded mammals. So. Um, it can, can it can get in the water by sewage discharges, septic systems, stormwater runoff, animal waste, livestock, pets, geese. Um, a lot of the E. coli forms are not pathogenic, but some are associated with pretty serious illness. So that's why in recreational lakes we monitor for E. coli. So there's kind of two standards for a single sample, which is really applicable to how we're testing once per month, it, you want to have the samples less than 235 colon, colony forming units per 100 milliliters. If you're sampling more frequently, then the average of the samples should be less than 126. But with our monthly samples, we like to see them below 235. I got a question again. Sure. What's, what's the lifespan of the E. coli? In other words, once it's found to exist, how does it die or how do you get rid of it? Well, if, you, if you're in a rush, you can treat it. There are treatments that can be done with some oxidizing products. Eventually, it just disperses, dilutes, dies. I don't know. I mean, every there's a lot of E. coli is a lot of different species and they have all different. Um, you don't really dial down into the, the specifics of, of that. But typically, I would say within a week after a spill, we generally see levels returning to normal, but that's a generalization. But is it dispersing or is it dying? Some of both. I mean, it's, it's a little bit of both. It gets diluted and then some of the organisms die. They, they aren't going to be like reproducing and um, colonizing in the lake for, from a spill. They, they just disperse and, and some of them die. So I, I mean, I, I know I'm not carefully answering your question, but it's it's very different depending on which species it is, so. So they don't multiply in the water regardless? Well, not not in in the conditions in that would be found in the lake to the, to the, to the um, effect that they would continue to increase in counts in a lake this large. If you had like a really small stagnant water body and you, tried to grow E. coli in there, you could do it. But in a lake like this, it's not. I mean, you would have to have some major, major, major issues. Is it possible to quantify how much it takes to get a person sick so that it, as it's dispersing and dying, can a person, I mean, this is obviously a critical question yeah. we're talking about with swimming in the lake, how much does it take well, for somebody to become sick? And is that, is, it, is that answerable? No, it is not answerable because there's hundreds of different species and not all of them even cause illness. And to even test for that, I, I wouldn't even know how to go about like getting them down to species or what the cost would be for that. So typically, that's why beach closures. When you have counts that are elevated, you close the beach and you either treat or you retest until the quantities are back to normal and just don't use the water body. 
if a hypothetical we were to uh, test over a series of days um, the level is X on day one it rises on day four that increase does that mean that there was more contamination you're saying that it couldn't have multiplied and grown. It probably wouldn't have multiplied in these conditions to grow like that. It would probably be additional E. coli being spilled into the, the water. Yes. Okay. E. e. coli in a lake like that is going to die of starvation. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't have enough Within organic days, matter. Yeah. At the most. Yeah. It's, it's not, we're not culturing bacteria in the lake like they are in a laboratory setting. Yeah. If I understood the, the answer to your question on bullet four, does that mean we don't know whether it's pathogenic or not and we don't test for it? Nope. It's, I mean, that's, that is the, that is the EPA guidelines. So that's not a shortcoming in what your management is doing. That is not, that is the guidelines from the Environmental Protection Agency. It's not, you don't test for specific species. And the reason, is it too expensive? Imagine, I don't know exactly how many species of E. coli there are, but I mean, to test for every single one of those would be overwhelming. And I think there's still a lot that's maybe not even known about which ones are pathogenic, pathogenic and, and which ones aren't. So t to basically, to minimize the amount of testing and the human health risk, if you get counts above the 235, then that's an advisory. So I know there's been some incidents. Um, this is what our testing has shown. One spike on Beach 4, um, that was in July. So that's what, that's what we've found so far. Um, and actually, we just got the tests in literally when we got here. Everything from, when did you test? Uh, last week. Thanks. Last week, those results came in today and everything was below 25. So all is, all is well in the areas that we sampled. And Tyler's gonna be taking some samples today as well. Um, I got a quick question. How many samples are we talking about when you say you, you tested? One sample from each site. From each of the beaches and then the three additional locations as well. And it takes you a week to get the results back? About, yeah. yeah. That's about usually what the turnaround time is. We, so we have to ship the samples to the laboratory. If there's an emergent testing need, then you would actually hand deliver the samples to a, a local laboratory, which I believe is when you test, that's the way that it's done. So when the, when the lake has an incident, we then pull additional samples, drive them to Richmond, and apply, they're tested on the same standards that the solitude tests are done monthly. That's how we turn, but we are, we are paying a premium to turn those results overnight uh, versus our contract rate with solitude. And over time, typically your E. coli problems have been associated with known incidents, to my knowledge. I don't know of any like questionable times where we got E. coli results that were um, not able to be attributed to a specific event. All right, and then algae. Um, so algae is a very general term for a large group of organisms that are photosynthetic. So they produce oxygen and uh, make their own nutrients. Um, planktonic green algae, base of the food chain, beneficial, why we like productive lakes for fisheries. Um, cyanobacteria though, um, they're also known as blue-green algae, although they're not algae, they are actually photosynthetic bacteria, so they do photosynthesize, so that's why they're kind of grouped together. But they can be extremely harmful under certain conditions, they can produce toxins, hundreds of different types of toxins, some are skin toxins, liver toxins, neurotoxins, um, some of the toxins have been associated with Alzheimer's and Lou Gehrig's disease. So they, I'm sure, I don't, um, you know, there's been reports of dogs dying in other states. I don't know of any in Virginia, but where dogs have ingested water that has cyanobacteria in it and they've died pretty quickly. So it can be extremely bad. So that's one of the reasons why we sample for them in recreational lakes. And uh, one thing it's important to note is that the algal community 
is extremely variable. It, it varies throughout the season, and it also varies from year to year, and it varies based on water quality. Typically though, you see your green algae coming in earlier in the spring, and then as you get into the fall, if you're gonna have cyanobacteria concerns, it's usually late summer where you start to see those. So these are your algae results. So um, the red species here are the only species of cyanobacteria that we found in the lake. So there's a little there, a little there, a little there, and a little bit there. That's not a cyano species. It's great. It's really, that's great results just for a frame of reference. Uh, the, a lake closure for recreation would happen at 100,000 cells per milliliter. Your maximum count was 4,000. So from the standpoint of recreational safety and water quality, it's awesome. Where we're struggling a little bit is for the fisheries goals, having this situation makes it more difficult to create a productive fishery, so. What's the algae that I see on the bottom of the lake? Those are probably some type of filamentous species that starts um, down on the bottom and as they photosynthesize, um, they may incorporate air into the mats and they may rise up to the surface or some of them just stay epiphytic down on the bottom. Generally, they're not harmful, and if they, if there were, say, lingbia, for instance, is a cyano species that can start on the bottom, it would show up in in our counts. So you're not testing Tufton for algae. No, we're not. That's not part of our contract. We have in the past, when there's been um, concerns, we have been asked to do it, and we have done it previously, but that's not part of our regular testing. So just some general recommendations, continue monitoring. We have recommended sediment testing. I think that would be a really good idea to do that because what we would be testing for is looking at the phosphorus in the sediment to see what the potential for that release of the orthophosphate is. And if we were to do that testing and we find that there's not a lot of phosphorus, you know, a lot of loosely bound phosphorus that could be released, we could reduce the frequency and intensity of our monitoring and maybe not do as much um, effort or cost. So I think that would be a good use of, of funds. Okay, question about the, the water this year. Um, you, with the low phosphorus, you'd say that there'd be less algae, the water should be super clear, but it hasn't been super clear. In Adams Cove there, it's, it's always been just sort of brown stained. I don't understand. Yeah, can't really see through it like I have in years past. There's a lot of things that can cause that turbidity. Some of it could be algae. Some of it could be zooplankton. Um, it could be just suspended sediment. It could be tannins from leaves. So we do have um, water clarity panels we can do to kind of try to figure out what is causing the turbidity. A lot of times it is some sort of, especially if it's in an isolated cove, it's probably a lot of resuspended organic matter generally, but that's a big generalization. What about rain? Rain events can certainly, if you're, have, I mean, if you have a rain event and you see chocolate milk coming into the lake, there's a good chance the lake is gonna have that chocolate milky look for a while until some of that settles out. In a related question, mm -hmm. as the lake level drops, you start to see like a grayish dark film that's on the rock and sea walls. Is that related to algae or is that something else? It could be algae. I, it could just be schmutz, for lack of a, a better word. It could just be suspended particles that are settling down. It, it's hard to know what, what it is. The water in this spring was very clear, especially in the shallow. Yep. And I mean, honestly, I know the fishermen don't like to hear it, but this is dream water quality for a recreational lake. Uh, there are other water bodies in Virginia. You're very fortunate to have the resource that you have with, with Lake Monticello. It's a beautiful lake. Some are very fortunate. <laughs> we have a swimming pool for that purpose, <laughs> in my opinion. All right, so um, as Shannon mentioned, uh, you know, from a fishery standpoint, we want productivity to be increased. Usually phytoplankton, fish food um, are kind of your two primary ways to increase productivity in a lake. Um, we don't necessarily have the luxury of doing either of those at this lake, just with the multiple stakeholders involved. 
So one of the big focuses we've made has been focusing on fish habitat over the last uh, about nine years or so um, in the form of installing mossbacks. And then a couple of years ago, we had started installing uh, aquatic vegetation. We did an initial study where we actually put plants in cages up and down the lake, a systemic study that uh, we had new areas might not do great, but we wanted to just assess where plants were going to do well, what species were going to do well, and from that be able to make decisions in the future. Um, so in 2021, we went ahead and uh, we identified that the upper end of Van Buren was really pretty much from Beach 5 um, past the utility into that upper area was the areas that were doing the most um, productive. And so the idea was to get founder colonies established up there. Those plants would then be able to um, essentially seed the rest of the lake. Um, it's been going at a, a rate that's been a little bit slower than um, like we would like to have seen, but there's issues with herbivory from grass carp, uh, deer, muskrats, there's different things that are going to come into the lake and eat those. Um, so what we've tried to identify are uh, primarily two species that have done really well historically. Um, a third has been uh, identified as well. So in the top corner, on the top right from the screen there, that's a pickerel weed. Um, that's a plant, gets a pretty purple flower on it, so um, it has done okay out here. Um, hasn't done really great, but due to the aesthetic appeal of it, that's something that we wanted to try and get established as well. Um, we've also worked on getting, in the bottom right, that's called water willow. Um, that's the one that you see for the most part um, around that utility crossing. There's been observed down in the lower lake at, from fragmentation. Um, so the plants have actually broke apart and then drifted down through the lake and then observed in the riprap on the dam. Um, so that's been a great uh, plant that we've been able to have success with, as well as um, the last one I don't have a picture of, but it's pretty easily identifiable. It looks like a lily pad um, that kind of stands out of the water. It's called spatter dock. Um, the reason that we've identified um, in particular the spatter dock and the water willow is they have a higher, re they're more resistant to grass carp. Um, so certain species, you plant them, um, the grass carp can come in there and uproot them, and ultimately as uh, submersed vegetation comes back into the lake, that's likely going to be the um, route that's taken to achieve control of that vegetation. So we wanted to have something that was more resistant, more tolerant to those grass carp herbivory. Um, so that's where we've been focusing on trying to get the water willow and spatter dock established. Um, we did 750 plants in 21, about 800 in 2022. Um, we've had to keep them for the most part in exclosures to try and prevent some of that herbivory while they're getting established. Um, with the goal of being once they're established, you can remove those cages and not have any issues there. Um, the spatter dock seems to be doing really well, um, not having to be caged off or anything. Uh, the water willow is, is doing well as, uh, in those upper areas, and then the pickerel weed, as I mentioned, is just kind of, um, it's something we want to see succeed, but it's, it's not having the same level of success as the uh, spatter dock and the water willow. Um, and then the water willow, for the most part, is going to grow from your shoreline out to maybe eight to 10 inches of water, sometimes deeper. Um, and then the spatter dock is gonna be out in a little bit deeper water, depending on water clarity. But up in the upper end of Van Buren, we've been seeing it in about four feet, um, three to four feet of water is about where we're kind of seeing that max, max extent of it. Um, so that's just kind of a quick overview of the aquatic plants. Quick sure. question, yeah, in Adams Cave, where I've been snorkeling for the past almost 40 years, mm -hmm. uh, went through a period of where there was a lot of hydrilla, Lots of fish. It was like an aquarium down there. Now it's like a moonscape. Like sure. It's just that algae on the bottom. And and what? Why did that happen? Grass. Uh, grass carp. Um, that's uh, so. Hydrilla is a non-native invasive species. Um, fishermen love it, uh, and it's a great thing that holds fish on it. Um, there's alternatives to it um, because it is a non-native plant. Um, it is invasive, and it it can take over very quickly. Um, that interferes with you know recreating, swimming, jumping in. It was there was a lot of it, but it never really interfered. I, maybe there wasn't enough phosphorus for it to mm -hmm. go crazy, so it was there. But so so you're saying the grass carp basically eating all of it? Correct. Yeah. That would be where I'd say probably 95 to 100 percent of it is. What does it take to get rid of grass carp? Um, they have a life expectancy of about 15 years. Um, 10 to 15 years. Are they reproducing? They do not. So the way that grass carp are um, s sterilized, uh, their triploid grass carp, is out in Arkansas. Um, the fish farms out there, they work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They heat treat the eggs, they get them up to a temperature, it makes them have an extra chromosome. And that extra chromosome makes them a sterile fish that they're not able to reproduce. 
And U.S. Fish and Game doesn't just take the word that you did it, it's great. They actually will go in, the fish farm will test every single fish that comes out of their hatchery. And then out of that batch of say a thousand that they just tested that they're gonna stock in Lake Monticello, Fish and Game will come in and they will pull a sample off of that, uh, say a hundred fish. And of those hundred fish, they can't have a single one. I think it's 99.2% that they have to be. Um, so they do go through a very rigorous testing to make sure that they are a sterile fish. Do we know when the last time the grass carp was? was uh, yes, 2006. 2006. 2006, okay. So we should be getting toward the end of their lifespan. Correct. They're it pretty varies a little bit. Uh, you know, 15 years, I'd say, is about your average. Um, and they'll get up to 48 inches in size, some of them. Here, it was, yeah, it was yeah. Yeah. Kind of fun if you hook them in. <laughs> but uh, they do get very big in that later half of their life. We're on the 17th year. That's right. That's out. They are. Yeah. And if anecdotally, my observation is they're on the decline. I have not seen near as many this year. Okay. We so haven't seen as many either. Yeah. Right. yeah. Exactly. Be careful what you wish for, though, in all honesty. I mean, I know that's another one of those dichotomies where the fishermen and the recreational users are not going to agree. Hydrilla. Maybe a little bit here and there is good, but it can devastate a fishery over time. It can have, it can take over the spawning habitat. It can cause dissolved oxygen problems. It can make it impossible to fish also. So there's... Yeah. My sense of it after spending a lot of time worrying about this stuff is that we will undoubtedly be on a seesaw You're right. history with grass carp and hydrilla or, or other yeah. invasive Okay. Yep. I have not observed any on any of our sampling events that we've done. Um, we're not necessarily throwing rakes out and trying to sample and see if there is vegetation. You would see it in most areas that we would be doing these plantings though, um, especially in the areas with less boat traffic um, in the upper end of Van Buren, for example. Uh, you would see it, you would observe it kind of thing and it takes off quick. Um, so I think the grass carp, um, Shannon might be able to speak more to this, but that uh, the Tubers for hydrilla can live in the sediment though for years without sprouting. So you can go and you think everything's under control and then you make it three years down the road and then hydrilla comes back even though your grass carp are gone and you haven't seen grass carp for three years, hydrilla hasn't been there for three years, that plant can come right back up from the sediment. And I That's the, the problem with grass carp for hydrilla management is it's sort of all or nothing. Either you have too many and you end up with a bathtub or you don't have enough and you still have weed issues. It's really hard to get that balance for a perfect control. It's a biological control. It's inexpensive and it's been really effective in the lake at controlling the hydrilla. Um, but there's trade-offs. In our area, we didn't, we, you know, the, the hydrilla just never got out of control, but I could see maybe shallower areas. Shallower areas. areas. Yeah. Been, okay. Usually it's just a matter of time. You know, it could be a year, it could be five years. It, it's going to kind of get there. And hydrilla, especially in clear water like you have in Lake Monticello, can grow really deep. It grows deeper than any other plant. It has, it has less need for light for photosynthesis, so it can outcompete native vegetation and just, I mean, it'll, it, it becomes a monoculture and it's not a positive Does end result. Does to do um, any management <coughs> of submergent? vegetation sort yeah maybe do so there was a method to do this other than it's generally in large yeah i mean in large lakes it's generally budget driven i mean the the preferred method for treating hydrilla with an herbicide is uh fluoridone treatment and i can't even imagine how much that would cost in in this lake it would be extremely expensive grass carp are much less um much less expensive. So, but primarily the problem uh, would be in the coves because uh, I, I know it can grow deep, but it, it, hydrilla that's in 20 feet is not going to come to the surface. Oh, it can. Oh, it can. Uh, <laughs> all over the United States, I've never seen it and can. Uh, I, I have. And they will go yeah. uh, typically 12 feet is it's about totally yeah. dependent on water water clarity how yeah, we've far. got such deep water quickly off the bank that i can't imagine that in the main area of this lake yeah in 60 feet turn, of water it's not going to be an issue maybe to 30 to 40 feet probably not but um in shallower water and i wanted to ask with the uh, grass card <laughs> we are certain they are not greedy 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's, even if you had one out of a thousand fish that wasn't triploid, who's it gonna mate with? It's, there's not gonna be anybody there to... It's been 17 years, so the ones we have should generally be the same size. <laughs> I think they were stocked in fish. There's a couple different generations of grass carp, um, and I can pull up the when they were all stocked. We, we have that information, I believe, from when we did it. Um, but uh, it's not generally, it's not always going to be the same size fish. In general, I'd say 70 to 80 percent of the, if you were to stock fish in 20 uh, or 2006, um, those fish should all be the same size. Probably 80 percent of them are that same size, but you're going to have a few that just genetically either didn't get to that same size class, they didn't have the food availability, they weren't aggressive enough and hungry enough to grow quick enough to control it and then as the vegetation disappears they're not there's not as much there for them to eat and grow. So uh, Solitude's opinion of the grass cart is they're fine let them do what they're doing and then die? I would yes. Um, grass it's the most cost-effective control for vegetation. So we're getting rid of an invasive species with an invasive species. Except no, it's, it's a non-eating invasive yeah. species. It's a sterile it's a, it's a non-native. Sterile. It's a non-native sterile species. Um, so way too far to the no, yeah. no plant line. And to the point over there, that's every lake. Look at um, Lake of the Woods. They had I don't know maybe 15 years ago horrible hydrilla problem. Mm -hmm. um, and now. They stocked a ton of triploid grass carp there. They don't have the hydrilla issues, but now they're getting some water quality issues. So, I mean, it's, there's, there's trade-offs. Managing lakes is really complicated. Um, I think it was, I'd have to look back um, without, for, to tell you for sure. Um, I, I don't have that information in front of me right now though, as to how many times they were stocked. So what is it about the hydrilla that allowed it to grow in the lower part of the lake and we can't seem to get anything else to grow in <laughs> The fact that it's an invasive species and it's just very, uh, I guess, it, yeah. Its nickname is the perfect weed. That's, if it could be a food source, it would be, I mean, it outcompetes everything. It needs less light, it needs, needs less nutrients. It has, it reproduces by fragmentation. Even one tiny little rosette of hydrilla, if it floats around, it can reroot itself. It produces both tubers and turions, which are reproductive structures that the tubers are persistent at least for a decade. There's some disagreement in liter the literature about it. Um, it is, a re it's a very well adapted to spreading and growing. So that's why it's, and there are some challenges in the lake with substrate and boat traffic and things like that that do make it difficult to get uh, vegetation established. So the plants that you had were mostly, it looked like they were surface plants that went down. Think, is there an underwater plant that isn't quite as bad as hydrilla that could be introduced? So we have tried um, planting vallisneria or eelgrass um, and didn't have much success with that uh, due to whether it was a rivery from crayfish, uh, turtles, or just the substrate driven. Um, that was kind of one of the plants that we were looking at as an alternative for a submersed vegetation. Um, but didn't have great results to try and continue with that. Um, maybe as we get vegetation established and there's more of it and you can kind of almost like hide it, so to speak, um, and that vegetation can be underneath the, the spatter dock and in areas um, where it's not the only thing sitting out available for something to eat, um, that it could be worth revisiting in the future. How, yes. how does dredging in the coves affect the, the plant life? I've seen them dredge mm -hmm. in Monroe Cove really close to shore during during uh, the spawning season. So I would say as long as they're not digging up the plants themselves or anything, it's probably having limited impact um, on the actual plants that we're planting or anything. Um, if they were to go in there and pulling them up and things like that, then that would be an issue. But if they're getting close to it or anything like that. They're, they're dredging uh, down to eight feet probably, mm -hmm. three feet from shore. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these plants were focusing on that, that buffer from the water to probably about three to five feet out. Um, we're trying to stay probably in that um, probably 10 inches of water with the water willow, um, getting that kind of established there. And then that spatter dot can still grow down to a depth um, five feet deep or anything like that. So there's still going to be pockets where that vegetation is able to establish. What they're dredging out, they're piling up at Tufton Pond. And Mm -hmm. Just saying people can't even really use that in their gardens because there's just no <coughs> nutrients or 
Is that is it really sandy material or is it organic silt rock? Silt rock. Yeah. Silt and rock. <laughs> yeah it, that's not super valuable as any kind of soil in it. But is that why plants aren't? That's one of the challenges is some of the substrate just doesn't have a lot of organic matter. There's, there's a, um, if you have too much soupy muck, then there's not enough substrate for the plant roots to grab on and get established. Or, and if it's too hard packed and not enough nutrients, it's also difficult to get plants established. So, so what is that? Goldilocks, it's a Goldilocks situation. For maintenance, do, but they just talked about dredging too close to shore. Does the dredger guy have any restraints or knowledge or awareness of to not dig up the plants oh, they're going to absolutely yeah we, all of these locations are marked uh, our operator has been doing this for many years I know. and uh, knows knows these codes intimately well but we know where these plantings are and uh, the dredger would not go near these plantings no. okay and they are emergent so you do see them from a distance they're not hidden under the water or anything like that. The plants in Van Buren that are doing well, <clears throat> that's the main inflow of water to the lake from Tufton Pond. Does mm -hmm. that have anything to do with why they're doing better up there than other places? I think the bigger things that are kind of contributing to their success up there are limited wave action from boat, wa uh, boat wakes. Um, the nutrients are up in there, and then the substrate, um, just from doing the planting of myself around different areas of the lake, that was by far the best substrate um, up there. It was kind of that mix, like Shannon was kind of alluding to, it was soft enough but hard enough. As you get further down lake, a lot of it's just rock and hard and clay and things like that. So um, we can come back as needed, but we'll dive in real quick to uh, the status of the fishery. Um, I wanted to kind of uh, look at the bigger picture. I know we've kind of in the past we've you know either looked at this year or this year compared to the last time we did the study um, but I wanted to share on the next two slides there are going to be two graphs relating to uh, 2014 to when we did the last uh, electrofishing study in 21 and show the improvements that have been made um, in relative weight on the bass as well as the size class of the bass and relative weight uh, for lack of a better description it's how fat the fish are um, they uh, relative weight of 100 is like your normal fish. Uh, as you start getting down, um, it, it's not necessarily a zero to 100. If a fish had a relative weight of 50, it's probably hanging on for dear life. Um, and probably gonna, it's very skinny, very ax-like. And then the same thing, if it's a relative weight of 150, that's almost obese. Um, like it's uh, just not very common. Um, so when you see the graphs, they're all gonna kind of be in that usually I'd say like 70 to 110, 120 is kind of where we're looking at with 100 being like a, a balanced fishery. Um, so just kind of some things to keep in mind as we move on to the next slides. Um, we'll look at those two characteristics and how they have um, increased and done better um, since we started in 2014. And that's not necessarily just due to stocking bluegill or just due to harvesting or just due to habitat. It's all these little things that have been done over time that have made incremental impacts on the fishery. Um, so that's something um, as we kind of talk about here in the next uh, few slides, just to keep in mind. Um, habitat is something that you know we've talked about really since 2014, is just trying to get some sort of habitat in the lake. Um, the docks and the piers and things like that are great, but we needed additional forms of habitat in the form of, um, in this particular case, it was artificial structure, um, mossback fish habitats, which you can see down, if you just walk down to the dock right here, they're hanging underneath. Um, but they're designed to essentially not move during waves or anything like that, so you don't have a risk of swimmers or anything like that getting entangled in them. Um, if you were to tie up a bunch of Christmas trees and sink them and then they float up or anything like that. So that's why we went with artificial fish structure out here. Um, still can be um, improved and that's what we're looking at with the additional, um, I think there was a few mossback structures that were left that we needed to get in, and then additionally trying to get the uh, habitat established around the perimeter in the forms of plants, vegetation, and uh, trying to make different areas for bug life, for fish to uh, kind of act in and uh, hide in for predator-prey ratios, things like that. And then we did have a low catch per unit effort in the last electrofishing study, um, and even though we have uh, 
stocked bluegill over the last couple of years, and I have the numbers as to when we stocked, how many we stocked, things like that. There's kind of two things that I would I'd mention on this is um, those bluegill, I wouldn't say, it's not necessarily that their population has dec declined to the degree that it looks like. Um, it could have just been due to sampling um, inefficiencies that were in different areas when we were completing the electro fishing. Um, or just or they could have gotten eaten. I don't see that being the characteristic. I mean, you can walk down on a lot of these piers around the beaches and see bluegill swimming around beside you, see beds, things like that. Um, so I think it's somewhere in the middle as to, I don't think they're all gone, but I don't think it's still at the degree that it was during the last sample. Um, but something we definitely want to continue to monitor and assess to determine um, what improvements need to be made in the form of supporting the bluegill, because that is the base of the food chain. That's your forage base for the fishery. Why are the bluegill having a tough time? Um, it's a little bit with the, uh, the lack of habitat, I'd say, is probably the biggest one. Um, they are just getting eaten. Uh, so in the form of increasing your habitat, um, increasing harvest on largemouth bass, as well as um, black crappie, white perch, uh, bullheads, things like that will eat. Um, crappie can eat them when they're little small bluegill before they have a chance for them to get up to three, four inches in size. Um, but there's also a good number of bass in the lake that need to be harvested that are eating those bluegill as well, and there's just not enough food to go around the dinner table. Pat consisting of plant life. And Plants and, uh, yes. That we don't have. That we don't have. Correct. Yeah, I can tell you in Adams Cove, the bluegill population is probably uh, a quarter, of, or maybe even 20% of what it was. Okay. Seven years ago. <clears throat> Used to be hundreds, and now I'd see from the dock, and now dozens. And that's something where, with doing the assessment, you know, it's, uh, I don't necessarily want to draw too much data or too much of a conclusion from one data point. Like Shannon was saying with water quality, we're looking at trends over time, not necessarily it was a, a different moon phase that had fish deeper, or different things like that. So that's where having uh, consistent data, um, frequent data is able to kind of allow those conclusions. Many times me going down looking over the course of the summer, this summer, last summer. Okay. So Tyler, you're information it is from the electroshocking. Correct. And the last time we electroshocked was? In 2021. And then we were comparing that to 2017 data. So there was about a four year, four, yeah, four years um, in between those data sets there. Every four years, uh, is that good enough? It's finding that balance of budget and, and data. Um, there's some lakes that we will shock twice a year. We'll shock spring and fall just to keep a finger on the pulse for mother nature not to interfere with. Um, communities and lakes that are of like this size, usually I like to see it at least at least annually, maybe once every two years. Um, when you start talking four years in between um, sampling events, there's a, there's a lot that can happen in four years. We're, um, we're reacting in some cases to put additional bluegill in, and we're not sure if we was testing every year. Correct. Then we would be focused on more harvesting or things like that. Is bluegill the only bait fish that we do and why? So bluegill are the only fish that we have been stocking into the lake. Um, there are other forms you can stock. Um, there's both gizzard shad and threadfin shad. Um, threadfin shad die every year. Um, and then gizzard shad, the biggest drawback to gizzards, and there have been observed out here, so there's that as well. Um, but in a, a lake where you have high clarity, you can see several feet down, you don't have the productivity, those gizzard shad grow bigger, um, so they can hit 15 inches in size, and then a 12-inch bass isn't going to be able to hit, eat them and consume them. And so they're just taking up biomass in the lake um, and not really having a positive impact. Uh, gizzard shad are a good fit if you have a productive lake. They, instead of growing bigger, they grow and have a lot more offspring and babies, and they stick more to a four or five-inch size and they're more edible for the bass at that point. So that's... What about, uh, not the uh, either shad type, but what about the flathead minnow? Um, so there's uh, fathead minnow and golden shiners. Um, those are two that we, uh, you can stock and we do it in smaller um, water bodies for the most part. 276, uh, 72 acres is a, a large water body to try and stock um, golden shiners or fathead minnows into. Um, they get eaten very quickly. And even though they might, you might see them year over year, if you were to stock, uh, say, a thousand pounds of shiners, which is still a very small number and contributed to this lake here, um, 
by next, if you were to stock them this fall, by next spring, you might have 10, 10 pounds left. And um, they'll be there and they'll reproduce for generations on, but you don't have the, they don't have the biomass associated with like a bluegill when they spawn, they reproduce very well and effectively. Um, and they're able to reach a size that's a little more uh, edible um, or more bang for their buck kind of thing, like a, a three inch bluegill, four inch bluegill. Um, whereas the golden shiners, it's, it's more of a snack. Um, it's not a dinner, I guess. So, and the fathead minnows is kind of the same thing. They, uh, fathead minnows to a lesser degree because fathead minnows, they only get about two inches in size. Um, so they, bass would have to expend a lot of energy to eat a hundred fathead minnows to get the same diet as two or three bluegill. Um, so they're expending more energy eating those. And then the same thing, they're not great at reproducing to the degree that you would need in a lake like this. The flathead minnow, they, they get to three or four inches at adult. That would be a big adult, yeah. Yeah, I just think it's something, I, I, I think we're really hurting because we only have one food source. And that food source may be dwindling, we don't know because mm -hmm. we're not electroshocking enough to tell. Mm -hmm. And I think this comes back to the balancing act of all the people in the room that maybe aren't fishermen that are seeing their dollars getting spent on something like that. And then the, the reason for the bluegill, as Tyler's alluding to, most bang for your buck. They reproduce more, they produce more biomass. So you're getting the largest amount of benefit from your dollar compared to other species. That yeah, I guess stuff. the only thing I'm saying is when you do that, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. If something happens to the bluegill, we're back where we start. And we're not even gonna know if it happens for three or four years. Uh, that brings up the question, has anybody in this room ever seen a crawfish in this lake? Just a note about crawfish, if you are alluding to maybe stocking crawfish, be really careful about which ones you stock yeah, because yeah. non-native crawfish will cause big water clarity They're, issues. They're, from what I've read, yeah. and I don't have the education you don't, it's almost impossible. But it, I would have thought it would have been impossible to have a 360 acre lake. And I've been here since 2018. I haven't seen a crawfish. I haven't seen anything that would indicate a crawfish. Uh, when I put fish in a live well to bring to the net, you should be seeing parts mm -hmm. and you should be able to see in the gullet sometime, not once and mm -hmm. since 2008. It's just amazing. Yeah, that. and that's the predator, they're you know, heavy predator. Load. But that's just another thing that bass depend on in most lakes so we don't have. Mm -hmm. I, I just think we need something other than bluegill, and I think it would take twenty to thirty thousand of the flathead minnows on the initial stocking. It it would be a lot. So usually, to give you an idea, like ten pounds of forage takes it takes ten pounds of forage on the best day to grow one pound of bass. Um, Three thousand fathead minnows is either one pound or ten pounds. Um, but either way, uh, that's kind of the, that math there. So there's a lot of extra energy that it, it goes into them chasing down that extra forage. They're out there burning right now. And that's where having habitat that they can... This big. Right. You get here about 4, 8, 30 in the morning, mm -hmm. and this is the first year in three years it's happened. Right. But we've got a hat uh, going on uh, and the fry, and we got bass chasing them all over. So. I think they would welcome a two or three inch. Sure, yeah, it's definitely something to consider and we can talk about, yeah. Sure. Tyler, one other point. Um, a few years back, we experimented with fish feeders for bluegill. Mm -hmm. uh, it died because there was concern, I think, about grass carp eating food. Mm -hmm. With the grass carp diminishing, is it time for us to start reconsidering the use of fish feeders for the bluegill? I know it's expensive, uh, the feeders themselves are not cheap, but on a limited basis, I will tell you, we had some horrendous bluegill mm -hmm. uh, around those fish feeders until we uh, took them out. I'll, I'll answer it short and concise. I'll just say, yes, it's a possibility. And I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. Like it is something to consider. Um, and that's kind of where I'll leave it a little bit. Um, Cause there is some back, like background on it, filling feeders cost of the feed, uh, the maintenance of them and things like that, but they do help
grow bluegill. We had a lot of volunteer interest in it at the time, and those of us that were involved in it were very disappointed when the when the process was terminated, I think prematurely. Um, one other question, um, white perch. Uh, anecdotally, they seem to have blossomed this year, um, small, but seems lots a large quantity. Are they are they a bass food or are they a competitor or is it both? It's a little bit of both. Um, it's almost like a, a crappie in a sense, like a, a bass can eat a small black crappie, it can eat a small white perch. Um, but as they start getting bigger, they're competing for the same food. Um, that intermediate sized bass, a 12 inch bass is probably competing the same food source as like a six inch to eight inch white perch um, in the form of small bluegill, bug life, things like that. So there's, I would almost say it's more competition than a food source um, that's we occurring. Be um, promoting culling of the white perch. Yes. And that's something we've um, included, I think, in the last three, four reports has been uh, the harvest of white perch, um, black crappie, the catfish, uh, bullheads, um, and the bass, I think, less than 14 inches or 15 inches in size. I don't know that that policy is reflected with the signage at the lake or the, or the uh, fishing policies at the lake at this point. If it's been discussed, I don't think it's it's gotten to the point where the general public is, is aware of it. Okay. I don't think there's a lot of crappie in the lake. I don't think so. I mean, we haven't seen a lot in the, the data or anything. There, it's one of those that are there, and they go through boom and bust cycles. This spring, it must have been when they were spawning, because I was on them like crazy. Mm -hmm. But during the summer, you can't find them. Mm -hmm. I think the predominant fish in the lake right now is the white perch mm -hmm. over everything. They are just... And they can be hard to target with electrofishing surveys because um, of just the nature of where they're at in general. Um, electrofishing is predominantly used around the shoreline. Um, we focus on water that's less than six feet deep and you kind of are able to, uh, your centrarchids, so your bluegill and your bass kind of almost do like a deer in the headlights as you're coming up on them, makes them easier to capture. Uh, white perch, when they're out in open water, they can feel that electricity coming and they're either too deep or they feel it coming and they disperse before you're able to really accurately sample them. Um, so it is, there are methods um, via gill nets and things like that that you can do to assess the population of the, uh, really you're looking at the size class of the white perch though in doing so. It's not necessarily a population uh, catch per unit effort or anything like that. When we first met with, I guess it was sold to and set up the plan, I don't know how many years ago. Mm -hmm. the, I, the, the lake was not fertile enough really, and we didn't want to fertilize the lake because it would turn green. Mm -hmm. So the idea with the feeders was stock bluegill, put up feeders to grow those bluegill. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, once again, why that feeding of the bluegills stopped. Competition from grass park. Yeah, the grass carp, uh, they can't, so the, they do eat gra uh, vegetation, like hydrilla, great. Um, and then once they find out they can eat a protein pellet that uh, gives them a lot, you know, it's a lot easier to eat and it's more, they are able to grow more off of it. They sit right in front of those fish feeders. So that's that's a big thing. A lot of bluegill in the lake, a lot of bluegill are big, but I think we can get a really big trophy on Can you say that the carp, when you electro, you know, electro water, are they too shy to take off? You can, usually you see them, but you won't capture them unless you can get them into a corner. Um, they, carp in general, grass carp, common carp, um, they have like a sixth sense almost. They feel that electricity from a further distance and they can move down the shoreline. So you'll see them as you're working down on the boat. You'll see like something that just spooks really quick down there, cloud of dust or anything like that. Um, and you can usually, they'll go 10, 20 yards and then you can see them and you know what it was. Um, but you're not in general going to capture them. Um, to give you an idea, like we do uh, Swift Creek Reservoir outside of Chesterfield. Um, not, uh, I guess we've done it a couple of years um, ago. And we had six boats. We were working with the Department of Game and Inland Fish. Six boats for six hours of electrofishing roughly out there. And uh, we caught three carp. Um, 
and like they're loaded with grass carp. I mean, we could see them and they would move, but that's just the nature of how grass carp are. I've been watching this since 2013, because I've been here, I've been a part of everything you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, what I have not seen is any sort of maintenance figure that says that, okay, rather than throwing 20,000 bluegill out here today and 90,000 tomorrow, we got enough years now under our belt to say a, a maintenance amount of whatever, pick a number, 40,000 a year would be good. But I don't see or hear anything about that figure or even attaining that figure. Maybe LMOA knows better than that, but uh, that's a question I have. It's, it, it's attributed a lot to the electrofishing reports and the catch per unit effort themselves. Um, in Mother Nature, there isn't really a, a great answer as to it's 30,000 bluegill every year for the next 10 years um, because there are bass go through uh, different reproductive year, like they might have a really good spawn this year, have a high number of fish, you don't harvest as many fish. Um, there's different factors that go into that where it, they cause an impact on the bluegill population, whether by eating more of them, less of them, and so that in turn affects your stocking rates in the subsequent years. This is what I wanted to uh, get to earlier about the 2014 to 2021 comparison. This is what we call a relative weight graph. So on the bottom you have your length of fish and then uh, like I was saying about 60 to 100. And this is an anomaly up here. I think I should have gotten rid of that one. That's not a real fish. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, or that's the one you want to target. But uh, um, as you can see, this trend right here, the relative weights of the bass have actually increased um, over the last nine years. So our relative weights went from like an average of probably in the mid to upper 70s um, to an average close to 90 right now with a positive trend going upward. And all that's showing is that the bigger bass have more to eat than the smaller bass. Um, that's more or less what that positive trend is showing there. But it's not a, it's not a severe degree as this is. Um, in 2014, your big fish didn't have anything to eat and they were just growing old and not really packing on the weight or anything. So they were getting long, but not uh, heavy or anything. Um, this is again showing uh, what we call link frequency. So it's essentially, this is not the number of fish caught. So it's not we caught 30 fish. It's a percentage of the population of the fish uh, between eight inches and 24 inches, or it could go further out, but for this case. Um, and what I wanted to highlight here is we had this really big peak in 2014 of these 12 inch fish. And through multiple management strategies, harvesting, things like that, in 2021, and then we never had really many fish past 17 inches there in size. In 2021, we got rid of that 12 inch peak. So it's not 50% of the fish are that size and smaller. Um, we've since moved that graph a little bit to the right. And then we've actually extended that out to where um, this year, I think that 23 inch fish was eight pounds. Um, so we're getting larger fish, bigger fish. Um, so kind of as I was hinting at, even though the bluegill numbers have appeared to decline, that's where your bluegill have kind of gone is into bass growth. So um, something that isn't, you know, we don't want to lose focus on. I mean, that's the ultimate goal at the end of the day is to have a sustainable fishery with quality fish in it. So we're kind of getting to that quality fish now. We just need to be able to maintain those. How, how does our length to weight uh, stack up against the average that's used for Virginia waters? That's where this kind of comes into play. Um, this is kind of showing you how your length and weights compare to like an average fish. Um, I would say for like a, a large reservoir, um, if you were to compare this to like Caroline or another uh, lake like this, um, I would say you're, you're good to better um, kind of thing. Whereas a lot of lakes, it's 12 inch bass that are a tenth of a pound in size and that's all you have. Um, they don't have those bass out to 23 inches, 24, and even 17, 18, 19 inch fish. So I would say it's a pretty good improvement on most of the um, HOA or community lakes that we see in sample. Yeah, I, I know the improvement is there, but I also know I can catch a four pound bass and know that bass should be five pounds. Mm -hmm. And that's it's where it's common. Five right, eight, and some of these six, eight. You know, smaller fish, like, you know, as, as you get closer to that hundred, there is a, and I didn't include it in this because it essentially illustrates the same thing. There, the background of this graph is a length and a weight and there's a curve to it. And then that's, there is that graph that is in the reports and everything, but for the sake of time, we just kept it at this to try and be a little bit more concise with it. Do we do uh, scale samples when you do the electroshock? Do we know the age of the fish? That was last done, I think in 2017. I'd have to look back at my notes on that, but I believe it was 2017. 
Um, and it wasn't actually scales, I believe it was otolus, um, which is the ear bone. Um, and you count the rings of a tree, you count the rings of the fish, and you can figure out how old they are. And then you can, that actually had a back calculation to where you knew at age one it was this size, at age two it was this size, age three was that. I don't have that in front of me to know the year or the, the information that was uh, in that report though. So we, we don't really know if we've got a 18 inch fish, if it's three years old or eight years old. Um, we have that data from 20, like I said, 2017 is where I'm thinking. Um, and uh, don't quote me on that, but I think that's when it was done um, to where you have that information. But uh, as a general rule, like currently, I could not tell you that 18 inch fish is this size. Um, so as we kind of move into, you know, what recommendations we have um, from my side of the fishery, um, it's really to electrofish, understand what the fishery is doing, having more routine sampling. Um, I would love consistent data. Um, you know, we, you kind of take what you get and you can make assumptions off of it. But just being able to better understand how that year over year data uh, correlates. And then um, continuing the plantings now that we know what's doing well, where it's doing well, is trying to get a larger number of those established. And then um, any of the remaining fish cover that's available, um, go ahead and install that at, in the lake at um, areas we hi highlighted back in December. I guess this goes to you and LMOA management. What can we do as either just homeowners or lake front owners to improve the, holist the lake holistically? Okay, not just for fishing, not just for swimming, but holistically. Because um, you know it takes forever for the board to do anything. It takes forever for them to get something approved. And it gets approved one year, then we have the new board, and it's out the window. So um, many of us have been here for numerous years. What can we do on our own little 100 feet of lakefront, if we have lakefront, what can we do? Is there a list of plants that we can plant? Is there enzymes we can put in? Are there many bubblers we can put in? What can we do? So there's a couple things, and Shannon can kind of jump in as well on this. Um, but I would say, you know, increasing buffer around, so don't mow your grass right down to the edge and blow all the grass clippings directly into the lake. Um, don't bag up all your leaves, dump them into the lake, things like that. Preventing that organic matter that Shannon was saying goes into your phosphorus and nutrients, preventing as much of that from entering the lake on your side. Definitely some best management practices. Um, just trying to limit the amount of nutrients and fertilizer and organic matter getting into the lake. So I think Tyler hit on most of them. Beneficial buffers, um, they do so much for the lake. They create habitat. They, in my opinion, look better. Some people may think they like the scalp look a little bit better, but in general, they act as a filter for runoff before it gets into the lake. They stabilize the shoreline to help prevent erosion. So beneficial buffers, are you talking about the water willow, pickerel weed, and spatter dock? Or well, and even the grass the along the edge. If you just... In the water or out of the water? Both. Out of, out of the water. If you don't cut your grass and leave like that band of two feet, three feet of just taller grass, Yep. So, I mean, a, a buffer can be either aquatic plants in the water or terrestrial plants up on the shore. And you want to minimize the number of trees, obviously, because you want to be able to continue to see the lake. So you don't just stop mowing and let it go forever like that. You still do need to kind of manage that buffer area so it has beneficial vegetation in it. But certainly limit fertilizer use. Um, bag your leaves, bag your grass, um, you know, I, and again, grass, leaving your grass clippings out is really good for your lawn, so it's, there's a little bit of a trade-off there. Um, beneficial bacteria, I did make a slide about that. I know that's been something that has, you know, a lot of people have shown an interest in. It is a tool that we use in our management programs. They're essentially, when you have the breakdown of organic matter, it's bacteria that are doing it. It's like, humans taking probiotics to aid in our digestion. We can inoculate um, the lake with additional bacteria that will kind of enhance that process. And the, the dosages vary. We use them just as a maintenance dose in a lot of our small lake management plans for what's called bio dredging. You need to use much larger dosages of it. Um, the 
caveat is you can't really see the results in a short-term measurement. So you could put tons of bacteria in the water and literally tons in a lake this size and you're not going to be able to go out at the end of the season and be like, oh, there's a foot less muck than there was. It's a very long-term period of effectiveness. There will be water quality benefits, but and um, it also is expensive. I, you're looking about and this is just a guess product only, 2,500 to 3,000. The rates are variable among products, but probably 2,500 to $3,000 an acre each year for those products, which are applied during the, the growing season. So they are beneficial. There's no, um, they're not a licensed pesticide. So I don't know what the policy of the lake is as far as putting those products in as a homeowner. You would need to check with LMOA about that, but there certainly would be no restrictions on. Is there a list of uh, beneficial bacteria or products that we can use as a homeowner, throw it in, in the water, you know, uh, once a month, whatever, that's legal and good for the water that we can do? I know we shouldn't put anything in the water. I don't. Um, but I, want, I would love to if it's beneficial and, you know, even if the main LMO way does nothing, if enough of the homeowners do things, it will help. You know, so this is what we trying to find out. What can we do is a micro level. When LMO way takes care of the macro, that's good. What can we do from the bottom up? Can you have too many bluegill in the lake? You can, um, and what you would see is uh, that relative weight graph that we showed for bass, there's the same thing for bluegill, and you would have a, as the bluegill increased to over carrying capacity, that relative weight would decline um, significantly, so they would just be very skinny, not enough forage. Um, they'd still survive, but they wouldn't be nutritious, I guess. And that's rare. I would say probably, what, nine, excuse me, 95% of the lakes that we have. It seems like it's hard yeah. to catch bluegill in the lake. Where <laughs> little kids and grandchildren and stuff love catching them. You know, it's like, what if Lake Manitou will stock some every year, you know, moderate amount? Sure. Uh, definitely something we can consider. We have to stock bluegill every year. And that tells me we don't have a self-sustaining population of bluegill. They're starving to death, aren't they? They, I can pull up the data, but the relative weights were not suggestive of that. Like the, the bluegill that are in there are healthy bluegill. They're not underfed or anything like that. Uh, but they're not, the population is incre increasing. What limits the population of the bluegill? They don't have enough to eat. It's usually uh, suppression by the bass. The bass are eating your bluegill at a rate that's faster than they can reproduce themselves. So it's not a, a forage driven thing. It's usually a predator driven, trying to get your predator to prey ratio intact on that one. Correct, yeah. What's a good food for the bluegill? What are your, any recommendations? Um, I mean, they eat everything from your bugs to uh, small, uh, they can't eat small minnows like uh, and larvae and things. Commercial food, the, the biggest things I would keep in mind, um, we deal a lot with, it's called op optimal nutrition is the primary food that we do. Um, but you wanna focus on something that's a low phosphorus food. Um, it has the proper protein and uh, fat associated with it. And the other thing is, is um, kind of like if you go to the gym, there's different proteins that you can take and they all do different things. You can have the same two bags that say 15% or 20% protein. One of them, I mean, it could be cat poop that's digested protein and it doesn't go into fish food or fish growth, but it costs a third of the price. So there is a, a balancing act of uh, knowing what you're getting, what you're paying for, and that it's actually going into uh, fish growth. Some of the trade-off on bluegill fishing, by the way, just from a historical standpoint, is the size of the fish you put in the water. The, the size that we've been planting lately are spawning size bluegill. They're almost the size of your hand. They're not quite that big. But what that says is they have to be raised for a long time and fed a lot, meaning they're expensive. <laughs> the other option is to put bluegill in this big, which we also did. And you know what happens to them? They're eaten immediately. Yeah. So it's a waste of time to, to plant small bluegill. You have to plant larger bluegill that will spawn several times a year that will create the biomass that the bass can eat. That's a good point. And also the hauling cost of the larger fish. So it's kind of an, uh, you know, yeah.
Absolutely. And I don't know where you get the little ones from, but I think the big ones come from Southeast Asia or something. Like <laughs> Long way around. Arkansas. We had a lot of good times. We did have a couple dinner places. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's trying to leave Arkansas. When we looked at artificial plants where real plants won't grow, which is the majority of the lake. So uh, I guess I'm a little um, probably disconnected as to what you mean by artificial plants. Like, in my, in my mind, like I'm picturing what's in an aquarium and kind of like those things. Artificial habitat along the shoreline to provide cover for the, the, the mm -hmm. bluegill fry. Sure, and that's where, um, you know, having those mossbacks, they make different styles of them that have more complex um, structures and then they have some that are attributed more to bass, more to bluegill, things like that. Um, so that's kind of, if you're talking artificial structure, it's that's what I would be picturing kind of thing. I can't really, I don't personally know of any uh, like plastic aquatic grass substitute that you could put in there or anything. And then the only other thing I'll kind of say with artificial plants is um, they can actually cause uh, stress on bluegill or fish that are swimming through them. Um, if they get nicked or scraped or anything like that, it can, especially when the water is 85 degrees, 88 degrees, it's, it leads to an infection. Um, so that is a concern as well going with those. We were putting bass in the culling net mm -hmm. on Wednesday. On Thursday, the culling net was empty. And this happened three times this spring. Brand new mm -hmm. culling. Our, is it logical that the otters are eating the fish in the, in the culling yeah. net? Could be if they found a, an easy source for a meal and you kept filling it back up and filling it back up. I would put a little camera on it, like a trail camera, and you can monitor what is actually going on there. Um, but uh, it's, I couldn't tell you definitively it was an otter or not, but it's a possibility. Yeah. Yes. For our lake, what should we be doing to make sure we do not end up with this algae problem that's over at Lake Anna? I mean, that, that just hit one of the newspapers, and all right, do you have any thoughts or recommendations on that? You're a long way from that based on this water quality, but it can tip quickly. I think the same things we're talking about for fish habitat. I mean, your buffers are really good for water quality also. The same best management practices that we talked about, limiting fertilization, um, limiting the amount of organic matter that gets into the lake, looking at your drainages coming into the lake and trying to identify hot spots where you have a lot of sediment or organic matter coming in and try to reduce that. Um, you've already limited the wake boat traffic, which is another contributing factor to that. Um, any kind of erosion of soil or resuspension of organic matter can contribute to water quality degradation. But your water quality, again, I, I know I said it before, but there would be a lot of places, Smith Mountain Lake would be really happy to have this situation.